Uh, today we will discuss integral points and asymptotics of integral points. Uh, some basic data. We have a number field F and a finite set of places, well, including the Archimedean ones, or ring of S integers, smooth projective variety over our number field, and a sub variety D. So some equations with coefficients in F and we fix integral models. So it's all projective, so the coefficients are in our ring of integers. So a rational point is then, well, a section, uh, I mean clearing denominators, so we have like integral coordinates. And uh, uh, a DS integral point on X is a rational point with the property that for all places, outside S, this section doesn't meet the reduction, oh sorry, this is a D, the reduction of uh, uh, the boundary D at this place. So that's a D, so D, sorry, the notations kept changing. And the standard example is, uh, so we have a cubic surface, for example, like this, and then we put the divisor, you know, T equals zero, S just the infinite uh, place, then so what are integral points? Well, so we pick a representative integers, x, y, z, t integers, say primitive, and the property that uh, uh, this corresponding section is not in the reduction of the boundary mod v just means that uh, uh, p does not divide the t coordinates for all primes p. So, and t is an integer, and it's not divisible by any prime, so it's plus minus one. So t is plus minus one, then we are solving uh, a non-homogeneous equation, x cubed plus y cubed plus z e cubed is, so plus minus three. So these are integral points. Now, geometric background, a little bit of a geometric background. Uh, so we may assume that x is smooth, uh, passing to some resolution of singularities, and that d is a normal crossings divisor, and uh, so in particular, in the very beginning, D was just a sub-variety, maybe even a point. Then blowing up with sub-variety, we can replace it by a divisor. So, and that's what we'll generally do. So, and then uh, a rough classification, geometric classification of pairs uh, is uh, given by the location of this class Kx plus D with respect to the ample cone. In other words, if minus kx plus d is sample, then we speak about log Fano varieties, and if it's the opposite, then it's a variety of log general type. General log type, log general type, I mean, and then if uh, uh, we are neither here nor here, then we speak about log intermediate type, and again, there is a final classification um, that uh, is necessary in geometric questions, but. Uh, we'll leave it at that for our purposes. Mm, and so I like to think of uh, this pair uh, as a log K3 surface. So, um, all right. Now, the conjectures about uh, uh, the dependency or like the correspondence between sort of geometry and arithmetic, uh, so the first general type is the risky density, are as follows. So the lang voigta conjecture would say that if you have a variety of log general type, then uh, D S integral points are not the risky dense. So for any finite set S and uh, you know, any choice of models. And we could ask, so what happens in the opposite situation? A very similar in complete parallel fashion to what we discussed uh, mm, for rational points. If X D is log Fano, well, then you want to have some version of potential density. So what uh, is potential density for integral points? Well, first of all, we want to allow finite extensions of the ground field. I mean, we've seen plenty of examples where Fano varieties, the local surfaces over the rationals have no points at all, local or global abstractions. So there are similar things here, of course. I mean, you have to have rational points first. And once you pass to a finite extension of the ground field, we may also want to include in, in, enlarge the set of uh, places S because it can al always happen that, that some bad prime, uh, so your uh, DV, the reduction of your boundary mod that prime, just takes 
all the points there are, and there is nothing left. You can't pass a section. So once you enlarge the finite set of places, but you know, still to find set S prime, then you would want that uh, uh, S prime integral points on you know, some models of X and D over that uh, extension are the risky dense. And uh, it seems reasonable that in these situations uh, that this is what happens, but uh, in the local intermediate type case, well, uh, dense or no dense, again, uh, so Campana's uh, program uh, for rational points would give, I mean, conjecturally an if and only if statement. So he really has a version of a classification of algebraic varieties so that in the end he can say exactly when you have density and when you don't have density. And so this will be explained to detail in Professor Abramovich's lectures next week. And there is no uh, Campana program for in log geometry at this point. So this is clearly something that would be filled in, in you know, soon, I hope. So a geometric uh, version of this, uh, uh, log version of this classification. In any event, uh, there are some special cases uh, for density or not density say over number fields, legal theorem, Falting theorem, some of them being discussed in the lectures of Professor Darmon. And uh, what about the opposite situation, potential density of integral points? Well, we had uh, mentioned some results about uh, density of rational points, uh, uh, like on Fano threefolds. Uh, uh, in case of surfaces, there is a result by Boykers. So in the log case, three case, like, uh, we saw before, you take a smooth cubic surface and you take a hyperplane section like t equals zero. And then it turns out that the integral points on the complement are uh, potentially dense. So, uh, so he did it for smooth cubics. And uh, in fact, it's also related to a question of Silverman. Just take P2 and uh, take a cubic uh, curve in P2 and look at the set up, I mean, x is p2 and cubic curve is a section of minus kx. And then you ask, well, are integral points uh, potentially dense? So, uh, and um, well, that would resolve it. I mean, you pass to a cubic uh, uh, surface by looking at the corresponding triple cover and then you would have. Uh, so in any event, uh, there is a theorem which includes uh, both the cubic surface case p2 and the other the surfaces in between, degree two, degree one. If a smooth Tilpetsa surface and uh, a smooth uh, uh, section of the anti-canonical class, then uh, you get potential density of um, integral points. So this is like the log K3 case. Uh, but uh, there are still many interesting examples where you allow the Tilpetsa surface to be slightly singular. And again, look at special divisors and even singular uh, elements in this class minus Kx. And um, um, so, I mean, as we were doing it, we just saw that uh, quite a landscape that opens up, which uh, you know, uses classification of all these singular surfaces and special configurations. So this is an important paper by Keel and McKernan, where they show that uh, the complement uh, uh, X minus D can be geometrically at least covered by, say, or uh, affine line, some kind of useless complement. And uh, even the terminology there is, uh, well, entertaining, let's say. So they uh, speak about tigers, and then there is a chapter called Hunting the Tiger, and the General Elephant, and things like this. So I highly recommend this paper. It's actually a book, like 200 pages, where uh, you know, there are bananas and trees with bananas, and then they, they, well, their algorithm is, and the description of the algorithm is quite graphic. So in the analogs uh, over function fields of curves, I mean, geometry over function fields of curves, say complex curves over curves over finite fields, it's also very interesting. So, so this is being discussed in the course by Professor Starr that, well, if you have a Fano variety, then rational points are risky dense. So these are all the results that if you have a curve of general types and uh, sort of uh, before faultings. And then we ask, well, what happens in these intermediate type situations? And so here is like a recent result with uh, so Hazard and myself. So you look at the general quartic surface over a complex function field. 
then uh, rational points over that field are the risky dense. So this is not known for K3 surfaces, uh, quartic surfaces of K3 over number fields, for example, only in special cases where there are elliptic vibrations or automorphisms. And uh, well, so we hope that we can push um, the technique to make uh, sort of any quartic surface. So any quartic K3 should have, I mean, any K3 over function field should have this property. And uh, so the log versions of the above results about density of points over, uh, say, function fields, integral points, where F is a function field of a curve, so that's also quite interesting, and that's open. So even the analog of this result, uh, if X is log Fano, are integral points potentially dense. Even this is open, and uh, an interesting question. Yes. Well, uh, it's uh, we've yeah, it's a consequence of our result. We uh, pencils of quartics, there is a rational point. So, and in fact, we show that over the ground field, the points are the risky dense. Of course, it's not the case. Yeah. So even cubic surfaces over number fields don't have points necessarily, and quartics certainly as well. So, but in this course we focus, I mean, on varieties which have many points, many rational points, a priori, and so here many integral points, and uh, so th this is a setup. Uh, so we have our pair, we have the complement, we have integral points, and we want to count them. We already know what to do for rational points. Uh, we take some projective embedding, we have a notion of a height, and integral points being a subset of rational points, we do the same. So we have a line bundle, metrized, uh, that is, uh, well, we fix some norms that, uh, and there is only a choice at finitely many places. And then uh, we have the associated height on rational points, which we can restrict to integral points, and then we just count them. And in fact, we could look at uh, uh, any of the risky open subset, say, in uh, the complement to D. And uh, we hope that, uh, again, there will be uh, special effects, I call them in case of number fields, uh, in rational points, like accumulating subvarieties, absence of points, so that you have to pass to some extensions of the ground field and maybe uh, extensions of your set of places. So there are always instable uh, effects, which we hope to overcome. And then we ask, well, what's the relation between sort of the stable effects and the geometry? And uh, uh, of particular interest to us is the case of log final varieties, where at least conjecturally we hope to have many points, and we produce them uh, in sort of many interesting situations, just the way we did it for rational points. So in uh, so one way to produce many points is to take some linear algebraic group and then look at translates and then you can look at integral points on those orbits and things like this. So uh, one of the interesting cases is this case where the polarization is actually the log anti-canonical class and this class, uh, so that's what we'll be looking at. Now, uh, so integral points and rational points I mean, of course, uh, rational points are sort of a special case of integral points that just corresponds to the boundary D being the empty set. I mean, D is some sub variety, it could be just nothing. And there is no constraint. So rational points are integral points. Uh, now, uh, so we are sort of generalizing this discussion which we had before, but it also turns out that uh, this generalization is sort of very relevant uh, to co in, in questions about rational points. So there are some geometric links, if you like, between uh, sort of rational points and the risky density of rational points and even asymptotics and uh, integral points. And I want to demonstrate this in just some examples. So quite often uh, you find that uh, symmetric products of a variety like symmetric products of K3 surfaces or symmetric products of some varieties, exhibit additional structures, additional uh, uh, geometric um, data like vibrations, like uh, elliptic vibrations, abelian vibrations, that you can employ 
to prove more than what you are able to do on X itself. So, for example, Brennan Hassett and I proved that if you take any K3 surface over a number field, then there is some N, which is quite effective. Uh, it depends on the degree of the K3 surface, so that the symmetric product X to the N has density of rational points, or potential the risky density of rational points. And we do, don't do that for uh, a K3 surface, K3 surface over number field a priori. So then there is this map from just a product, say, to a symmetric square in this case. And, uh, well, where's the ramification? Uh, the branching is along the diagonal. Now, if we knew that integral points, delta integral points in the symmetric product where the risky dense, we would get density of rational points on x squared and then on x. So here we see this is like a trick which never worked. Uh, but uh, uh, there is a relation between density of integral points and rational points. And uh, in another application, which we've seen before, so we want to count rational points on varieties like projective space. And what do we do instinctively almost? Well, we say, well, a rational point here, it has a representative, so integral, vector, x0 up to xn, co prime coordinates. So, and then uh, counting rational points of bounded height, well, that's like counting integral points on, on here. And uh, in fact, we'll generalize this uh, on this slide. So what is happening? So we have some variety x, and we have some that is open subset u. And then there is this notion of a torsor uh, over uh, well, x or u. Now, uh, I mean, that uh, appeared sort of in the lectures of Professor Hassett and also Professor Crash. Uh, in fact, there is a way to, there is some canonical torsor, if you like, universal torsor, uh, namely, uh, uh, you look, uh, so to give a torsor over X, you need to give a homomorphism from the characters of the torus uh, to the Picard group of the base of X in this case. Well, if you say that the characters of the torus are simply isomorphic to the Picard group, I mean, in our cases, the Picard will be just uh, uh, well, Z to the R, then, uh, we could look at the most obvious homomorphisms we can think of, namely the isomorphism. And then the corresponding torsor over X, that's a universal torsor. So of course here, I mean, I'm only speaking geometrically, so over algebraically closed field. Uh, and now the idea is that, well, so you have rational points here, uh, then they should lift to, uh, rational or actually integral points here. So we should be able to pick some almost unique representatives for those rational points on the torsor, just the way we did it at the end, that you say, well, let's look at the integral points on a n plus one. So that's just z to the n plus one. But now we want to pick, we have some special integral structure. We want to pick the primitive representatives. And so this is what's happening here. And then there are still uh, this little indeterminacy that there is a plus minus one. I mean, after all, right, point on a projective space, it's up to multiplication. So here, again, uh, we would have to quotient out by the integral points of the neuron severi torus, or the Picard torus, uh, and over the integers, it would be like Z2 uh, to the power, whatever the dimension is of this T, and that's the rank of the Picard group. So the idea is that the counting of rational points downstairs can be lifted to the counting of integral points, integral with respect to some specific uh, structure on the torsor in some domain uh, which is determined by the height inequality. And so we look at uh, the Fano case, so this is ample, very ample, so we count rational points here and then uh, they should be, well, it should be the volume of some adelic domain on the torsor. Now, I will explain this passage in more detail later, but so the basic example is this PN, so rational points on PN then become this, and the domain on the torsor is just given by the uh, inequality, the height, sort of what's left of the height inequality so the upstairs. And then, well, it's straightforward, it's B to the N plus one, and the primitive will force a constant, one over zeta to the N plus one in here, and then there will be 
another sort of constant that uh, uh, Archimedean plays, because I mean our choice of norms, after all, is uh, basically arbitrary. Now, so this is a classic case PN, but then we had another supply of varieties, the historic varieties, which we discussed. Uh, so we have a toric variety, it's sort of very combinatorial, there is a fan, and there is a way of gluing uh, with affine charts, so we get some variety. So the fan was spanned by some vectors in the letters N, so E1 up to EN, and uh, uh, it turns out that the universal torsor is, uh, well, a subset in an affine space, uh, a n, where n is exactly the number of generators uh, of one dimensional cones in the fan. Now, minus something, so in case of a projective space, there was this like minus zero. So, and here it's sort of an analog of zero, so there's a well, closed sub variety, which is given like this. So, you pick your uh, cones in the fan, and then look all the one dimensional uh, um, vectors not in the cone and then you take a product over the corresponding variables and then it's uh, like hyperplanes basically and things like this. And so we have a tor action of the uh, neuron severi torus, the Picard torus, uh, just given by this exact sequence. So this is like your affine, uh, so when you do a life, so this is your affine space e, to, uh, space e to the n and so then you will have an action of uh, a dual torus from the exact sequence. So in particular, counting rational points on a toric variety, well, you still have the height inequality to keep track of, will amount to counting integral points on the affine space minus this something very explicit. But then uh, you'll have some height bound, which in this case is straightforward. It's uh, coordinates less equal than B, but in the general case, it's a product of some monomials, uh, I mean, it's a monomial, so product of uh, coordinates with some exponents less equal than B and maximum of that. And, um, well, so you have to implement that. So remember when I explained the uh, picture for toric varieties, we worked over any field and we worked with uh, tori split or non-split. So uh, if you want to uh, transfer that into uh, the language of uh, torsors, universal torsors, you have to worry about descent of uh, these uh, torsors to your ground field. So you can do it for toric varieties, but it's a non-trivial thing uh, in general. So descent issues are important. Now assume that we can descend. Well then it turns out that you can have uh, different forms which are isomorphic over the sort of splitting field, but not isomorphic over the ground field. And in fact, uh, uh, the isomorphism classes of these are parametrized by uh, this group, which we have seen before. Uh, now, it turns out that rational points then will be, well, in the union over rational points from these different torsors. But actually, so the way we're setting it up, so we pick some canonical representatives for our rational points on the torsor. Um, so this will be integral points uh, on the torsor, and then again there would be some ambiguity, uh, the action of the integral points of the um, Neron Severi torus, the Picard torus, and then what you'd have to do, you'd have to pick fundamental domains for these actions, and then in those domains you would have the height inequality, and then, and that's the idea which is due to Pere and Salberger, then indeed the counting of rational points on the original variety is uh, uh, given by certain uh, well, counts or, volu or certain volumes on the torsor. Now, the idea is that while on the original variety it's, so you have all these rational points and you don't see them as a lattice, on the torsor you have integral points, so that's a natural lattice. The height inequality will give you some domain, ball or you know, some domain, and then you would say, okay, so I have lattice points, I have a domain, the domain is growing, maybe it is the case that the volume of the domain will have something to do with uh, asymptotic uh, for the lattice points in this domain. And uh, then we are also looking at some primitive vectors in this domain. All right, so that will introduce some, uh, um, some factors which are like one over zeta n plus one we've seen for the projective space. 
So the idea is that, okay, if we can replace the lattice point count by some volumes on the torsor, if things work out there, in other words, if the error terms can be controlled, then yes, rational points will be given by such a sum. I mean, the asymptotic will be given by the sum. And that also explains uh, the main term, remember alpha, beta, tau, which we had for uh, asymptotics of rational points of bounded anti-canonical height. Well, where does everything come from? Uh, this volume, and that can be shown rigorously, is actually B log B rank pi car minus one times this constant alpha, which was, well, a special value of the Laplace transform of the set theoretic characteristic function of the dual cone to the cone of effective divisors, some rational number. So whatever it is. And then tau is the Sedelic integral that shows up. And it turns out that it's actually the same for all of these, independent of this, uh, um, well, I should be careful here. So what can happen in, in reality is that uh, some of these torsors, the delic points are, there are local obstructions. So you want to take integrals, but at some of the places, the thing can vanish. And that's where the obstruction, so to speak, the Brownian obstruction to weak, uh, to weak approximation would come in. So, uh, um, I mean, it may very well happen that this is not equal to the Adels and the obstruction will exactly be explained by um, uh, sort of, so that's a picture by you know, some summons here may vanish. So you just compute these volumes and the Tamagawa number of pair will, uh, will be assembled in this fashion. So that's the picture. And then the constant beta, the order of H1 Galois pick X bar, well, that's just sort of this sum that, uh, that shows up. I mean, that's a picture and the implementation of that for toric Fano varieties over the rationals, uh, well, was successful. And uh, uh, there's a long paper by uh, uh, Salberger explaining all these setups and so the Labritash uh, pushing this and uh, getting main terms and also quite accurate control about the error terms. So the Fano condition is still important. I mean, there are finitely many toric Fanos as there are finitely many sort of Fanos in each dimension. And uh, so this proof only worked over the rational skew. So doing uh, uh, counting rational points via the torsor technique uh, seems, so from the point of view of analytic number theory, uh, more difficult uh, than analyzing uh, the Poisson formula. Uh, so, and this is what we did in, uh, in our lectures. So we wrote down the Poisson formula and then uh, we analyzed the spectral side. But the advantage of this torso technique is that sometimes one is able to cover varieties which are not homogeneous, not related to algebraic groups, not compactifications of uh, uh, G mod H, or so nothing to do with homogeneous spaces. Uh, and one of such varieties is the Segre cubic threefold. So we'll see equations later on. Uh, so one way to visualize it, you take P3 and you blow it up in five points in general position. So that's sort of barrationally, of course, it's just barrational to P3, but it's, uh, it embeds into uh, uh, projective spaces a cubic um, hypersurface given by sum of xj cubed equal sum of xj equals zero, where j runs from zero to five. So it's like a very symmetric cubic threefold. And uh, one can count rational points on that via a lift to the universal torsor which in this case turns out to be a Grassmannian. So what happens is that you take the Grassmannian to six, which is like G mod P, and then you have a torus action on the other side. And once you quotient out by the torus on the other side, what's left has no, a priori, I mean, has no homogeneous structure. And so the harmonic analysis techniques you've been using for group compactifications, they just won't apply. But the torsor technique will apply and uh, it's, it gives a result. And again, over Q, and it's a substantial paper. I mean, it's quite difficult to follow through. Um, now, there are uh, more recent papers by his Brown, Browning, Derenthal, Joyce, 
where certain singular cubic surfaces or quartic Delpezzo surfaces are considered. Uh, the uh, universal torsors are written down uh, by the Cox reconstruction or otherwise. And then rational points are lifted to these torsors and uh, uh, one is able to uh, uh, get the estimates one wants, so uh, get uh, asymptotics of integral points in these bounded domains via um, uh, volumes. Um, so uh, let me give you an example, like completely down to earth example of what is actually happening. So there is a Delpezzo surface of degree phi, which is also a modelized space of five points on P1, compactification of that, and it's a blow up of P2 in four points in general position, and then you can always bring these points into these canonical coordinates, so you have sort of three points, and then here's the fourth point. And then, uh, so what's the anti-canonical embedding of this? So what do we have to do? So we take uh, cubic forms on P2 in our variables, x0, x1, x2, and we ask them to pass through these four points, sort of to vanish on those. Well, so that's what, what happens. So you have this kind of x i, x j, and i j run from 0, 1, 2. Uh, and so clearly, when you know, we have zeros, you have zeros, and 1, 1, 1, you also have you know, zero. Now, so what are we counting? So we take a primitive representative, x0, x1, x2, on these three, so on this p2, uh, minus, well, all these hyperplanes, x0 equals 0, x1 equals 0, and you know, x0 equals x1, and things like this. And then uh, our height translates into maximum of the absolute values of these uh, cubics, uh, well, divided by the greatest common divisor between these, and that should be less equal than b. So very explicit, once you sort of write down your x0, x1, x2, then you start counting. Now, uh, all right, so you realize that if x1 and x2 have common divisors, then uh, all these uh, terms will have that divisor. So with GCD condition, that makes you think that maybe you should introduce some greatest common divisors between uh, variables. So you do that. You put some greatest common divisors between xi and xj, and then so you take this, divide this by the other greatest common divisors. Then there is some other greatest common divisor you want to introduce of whatever is left, and then you put some coordinates here, so this divided by that. So then, you got rid of the greatest common divisor because uh, uh, the, the obvious things you sort of uh, cancel out from these monomials and then you show there is nothing else. So GCD of whatever is left is one. And then, it turns out that after labeling these uh, auxiliary vari variables that we introduced, uh, the big surprise is that uh, we are seeing uh, well, we have 10 variables, and uh, uh, they satisfy these equations, and uh, those are the Grassmannian to five equations. And then we have to think, well, what happens with our height inequality, this inequality? So you take this Sij, and then you start dividing by all these obvious uh, uh, common dividers, and then what's left is then a product of five coordinates from before, and uh, so all such products should be less equal than b. So all such products is just the traces of these si and the new coordinates. And in addition, you have uh, the property that, of course, once you've canceled out greatest common divisors, uh, yi and yj are co-prime, just because there isn't anything left. And so that leads to some co-primality conditions between these variables. And so you keep these co-primality conditions. So what's the problem now? You're counting instead of triples of integers, you're counting uh, 10 tuples of integers, uh, zij, uh, xij, this uh, property that well, they satisfy these equations, the Grassmannian equations, and then satisfy these uh, height inequalities, well, maximum over some uh, monomials like this, and then there is this uh, greatest common divisor condition. Now, so the theorem is that this greatest common divisor condition is not really relevant for the asymptotic because all it does is it multiplies the answer with something like one over zeta n plus one to the n, one over zeta n plus one. So it's a convergent Euler product which gets on top of the asymptotic. 
and uh, you can make it more precise. So this condition does not uh, deter you. So all you need to do is really let us point satisfying this and that. And that can be done. And this is what uh, the Labratesh uh, had done. And the Sagra cubic uh, is the same story for the Grassmannian 2-6. So again, you write down the Plucker equations for the Grassmannian and all these uh, new variables. And again, you have height inequalities which look like this. And then you have these hyperbolic domains and you want to sort of count points, estimate points. Uh, yes. Yes. Well, so the point is that you're not counting points on P2. You're counting points on the blow up of P2 in these four points. So it's a different variety. So what happens is that yes, so you have three integers which in some sense parametrize your rational points. How do they parametrize the rational points on some risky open subset of X, the complement to exceptional curves? Well, this is how they parametrize that. So you have this new coordinate, so this has a new coordinates, the Sij, and there are complicated expressions, well, very concrete expressions in the x's. And the height inequality now is, well, maximum of these expressions divided by the greatest common divisor of these expressions should be less equal than b. So. I guess the point you're making is that, uh, well, here, here you also have a system of equations. So this variety is a degree five Telpezzo surface. It satisfies the system of equations in a projective space of dimension you can count. No, but this is not what you're counting. We are not counting points on P2. We are counting points on the blow up of P2. So. Maybe I should explain it differently. Remember, so we had like two lectures about compactifications of tori and compactifications of additive groups. So we are counting points in the group. So all the points are parametrized by rational points in the group. The difficulty comes, of course, from the projective embedding, from the geometry. You can take the same group, like the affine space, and put it into projective space in many different ways. So that just amounts to, okay, so you have your variables on say, the affine space, x1, x2, xn, and then you pick any polynomial in x1, x2, xn, a system of polynomials, f1, f2, fr, and just put your affine space in the corresponding projective space. And the image is going to be described by very complicated equations. And so I'm counting triples of points with the property that the maximum of this cubic sink, that's the embedding of the open part, so P2 minus the lines through these points, gets embedded into the blow up of P2 into the projective space of this dimension, the number of these monomials, uh, of these cubics. So, so you just, uh, uh, you Exactly, so that maximum of this Sij over the greatest common divisor is less equal than B. So all that means is that I can parametrize rational points on the complement to exceptional curves on this Delpezzo surface by means of rational points on the complement to lines on P2. So I take an open piece of P2 and re-embed it into projective space. And then I count points in this re-embedding. So that's what's happening. That's well, so you can write it down explicitly. So the domain which you get in P2 and with Z3 is quite complicated. And moreover, it's not only counting lattice points in the domains, you count them subject to the fact that you have to divide by this greatest common divisor. And so that begins to introduce some conditions on the points in this domain, 
which are very hard to control. So yes, you start out with three coordinates, but the geometric or the problem which uh, you are led to, uh, that's the problem. Now you could argue uh, pa passage to the torso, you know, on the torso, it's also difficult to count points, maybe more difficult. Well, so this is not true what you're saying. So normally you say start with the cubic surface and then you produce the torso equation. So let's do that. So that's our next example. So start with the cubic surface as a Cayley cubic. It's a distinguished cubic surface for uh, A1 singularities. And then write down the torso equations. So now instead of counting uh, as before, just triples X0, X1, X2 subject to some constraints, so here the constraints are much easier. The constraints are just maximum of the coordinates, but uh, in addition we have this cubic equation that we have to satisfy. So that's our original variety X. Now on that variety X, uh, so how do we proceed? Uh, well, either you involve the machine which was explained in lectures of Professor Hassett, so cox rings, and then you write down these rings and you know, identify generators, that's what you get. Uh, or you uh, do what I've done for M05, you introduce greatest common divisors. Now uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, whichever way you proceed, so the universal torsor is given by these equations. They should be, you know, these equations. And then you have some height inequality, which is this. And then uh, you have some co-primality condition, which are these. And again, the co-primality condition, well, they will change your leading constant. There will be some uh, converging color products there. But the main difficulty is that, well, estimate the number of these y's subject to these constraints and subject to this height inequality. And so that's an effort. Now, of course, when you see this, and so let me tell you, for a smooth cubic surface, uh, we see uh, 27 variables and uh, 81 equations. So, uh, well, that's substantial. So, and then you have some height inequalities which are also products over, uh, you know, like trinomials. So you have like y1, y2, y3, less equal than b, and maximum are all those. And uh, I, so far, nobody has been able to analyze um, the torso or, you know, smooth cube or smooth cubic split surfaces. But uh, the Cayley cubing has been analyzed by Heath Brown and he was able to produce the correct upper bounds and lower bounds for well, rational points on the Cayley cubic of bounded height, but uh, so far we don't have an asymptotic. So uh, it's you know, fighting with uh, error terms and uh, so, so that's the picture. So I hope that now you sort of know what it means, like down to earth, like torsors and you know, what's happening. So this is what's happening. Now, in the formula uh, for the asymptotic we wrote down, there is this tau, this tau, this integral. And uh, I would like to explain what it is. I mean, it appeared in our harmonic analysis as well. And uh, uh, these are the definitions. So you start with uh, Fano variety. The final condition is not strictly necessary. In fact, our toric varieties, uh, uh, they did have the property that the anti-canonical class was in the interior of the effective cone, but it was not necessarily ample. And same thing for the compactifications of additive groups. Well, nevertheless, so suppose minus kx is equipped with an adelic metrization. So you have norms. So if you have a section, then there's a norm of that section at some point and uh, it's a number. So choose local analytic coordinates in the neighborhood of some viatic point. So you have small balls. And on that ball, your uh, section of the canonical line bundle, well, it's something like this. And then uh, you just take this and take its norm. So that's your number, viatic norm. And then you have a standard Haar measure on uh, FV to the D, which is normalized by the so integral over the integers OV to the D should be one over the local different uh, to the D over two. You know, square root of the local different to the D. And uh, that's some standard normalization of Haar measures in this theory. And then 
uh, it turns out that so we work locally on XFE. So this is an analytic manifold. So we have like these local charts, partitions of unity or something. And when we pass from chart to chart, there is sort of the norm of the Jacobian, the, abs the, the VRI absolute value of the Jacobian which shows up. But the way we set it up, it's going to cancel. So what's you know, spit out from the change of coordinates here will be compensated by uh, a factor coming from here. So this local measure, defined a priori locally in the neighborhood of a periodic point, globalizes to, well, a measure on XFV. So it's global in, in the viadic sense. It's not adelic yet, it's just local. But now comes the adelic part, so you'd like to integrate the product over all V of this measure which we just defined. Now the problem is, that's a typical problem, that uh, the adelic integral is going to diverge. So uh, now the way these problems are treated, uh, you look at uh, what the local uh, integrals are at almost all places, and you write down a closed form for that somehow, and then you see, well, if they're regularized by something very explicit, then I could take the corresponding uh, local factor, so take it out and put it back in. So, sorry, that is, this is a minus one. So this is lambda v to the minus one. And then, so this will converge, so regularized uh, measure, but then you have to account for this local factor somehow, and then you put the residue of the corresponding L function. And it turns out that the corresponding L function is simply the L function uh, of the Artin L functions of uh, pick X, considered as a Galois module. So for the Lepetsa surfaces, something you know, very explicit. And, uh, sorry? Uh, no, so pick R itself, not H1. Hmm? Yes, pick R, it's Z to the R with the Galois action as we've discussed. So it's an art, it's a representation of a finite group of this, yeah, finite dimensional representation. So that's what it is. And then the measure will, uh, uh, so the adelic integral will converge and you integrate over the closure of rational points in the adels in the direct product topology. So that's sort of the construction of uh, a Tamagawa number. Now, that's for rational points. As we have seen, so rational points, integral points, they are sort of in this balance and are, get, sort of are close together. So uh, I would like to say a few words about uh, a project with uh, Antoine uh, Chamberloir, uh, who will spe be speaking here next week, uh, concerning, well, integral points of bounded height with respect to the log uh, anti-canonical class. Uh, and then, uh, well, granted that all the minimal model program uh, inputs that we needed uh, for rational points, you know, these L primitive the fibration structures that we have discussed, that all of that works in the setup of, uh, uh, in, the, in the log geometric setup, uh, there'll certainly be, uh, you know, formulas similar to that for arbitrary polarizations. Um, and in fact, of course, we also have a big supply of varieties where we can actually check it without referring to uh, any kind of minimal model program and uh, those are the group compactifications and compactifications of homogeneous spaces. So in any event, the picture is like this. Uh, the asymptotic of integral points of bounded height should be given for this particular uh, line bundle again as b to the uh, one log b. Now there is some number here uh, R S minus one, and then there is alpha, beta, tau, and I want to explain what these numbers are. So, uh, the R S, well, it's the rank of the Picard of the complement X minus D, plus sum over all the places. Well, here I pick the infinite places separately. So these are finite places, these are infinite places, but it, you know, maybe I should just put it all together. S of R V, where R V, so, at uh, places in S, V. So here we have X and we have a boundary and uh, the boundary is going to split in some components. So, uh, so here we sit over V. So we have an X and we have some boundary. So this is DV. And um, so DV is, you know, maybe divided with normal crossings uh, when we choose a 
with models, and then uh, the claimant's polytope is the following. So for every uh, co-dimension one thing, so for every component of DV, you put a point. If two components intersect, then you put an edge between these two. If three components intersect, you put a face. So that's a claimant's polytope. It showed up in like, Hodge theory, so claimants needed it for something, the generations of Hodge structures or something like this. But uh, what happens in our case is that, well, so the dimension of this claimant's uh, polytope, if you like, so that's uh, maximal intersections. So in, in this kind of graph. So those points of maximal intersection contribute to the highest order pole, gives the pole. And uh, so you get the order of the pole will, will be this. And now what's uh, beta? Beta is going to be an analog of an H1, but not for the Picard as a module, but for the Picard of the complement, X minus D, or uh, modulo the relations. And then what are these Tamagawa numbers? Well, at all places outside S, you have some kind of Tamagawa volume, just the way I defined it before. Uh, and at finitely many places in S that I used to define the integral points, you have the following picture. So you have your Tamagawa measure on XV, but it turns out that uh, when you restrict to divisors or intersection of divisors, you have sort of a junction formula. You get uh, sort of metrizations of the canonical line bundles for the corresponding, uh, you know, strata, and then you can iterate the procedure and you get local measures on the strata. So on each DV you have this Tamagawa measure, on each intersection you have the Tamagawa measure, and then you need to take the strata of sort of maximal co-dimension and integrate this measure over the V-adic points of the strata. So that's a picture. And uh, uh, so this is a Tamagawa volume of uh, uh, the corresponding stratum in the Clemens, uh, um, in in the Clement's polytope, so we could have several faces uh, um, of maximal dimension or other uh, strata of uh, maximal co-dimension, and then you would have to sum over the contributions from these places. Now, where do we get it from? I mean, it looks quite complicated as it is, but uh, we have sort of our standard sub supply of examples, right? I mean, we don't pull these formulas out of the head or something. So if you look at the varieties, you know how to handle. Uh, this uh, harmonic analysis. So toric varieties, additive group complexifications, and other varieties. And then we say, okay, uh, what does it mean to count integral points instead of rational points? So this is an example. Uh, take these additive varieties and uh, let this be the boundary. It's sum of boundary components. And let's not worry about Galois actions. So let's assume all of this is split of the ground field. And so we have a normal crossing divider. Now, uh, we want to experiment. So we want to remove some D from um, the uh, variety X. And of course, we're going to take very specific Ds, namely those which are composed of boundary strata, of boundary components. And we can pick you know, components any way we like. So we choose a subset uh, and then put D to be just a union of the divisors for I in this subset. Now, if you did this for a toric variety, for example, and you removed all the boundary strata, then an integral point on the complement, well, it's just an integral point on a torus. So an integral point on a torus, counting those will be difficult. Well, it's like counting points on, on an abelian variety, because you take the what's a log anti-canonical class? Remember, the anti-canonical class on a toric variety was exactly the sum of the boundary divisors with coefficients one. Right? And now we remove the boundaries, the complete boundary. So we have like minus k kx plus all these boundary things, so that's zero. So we have a log Calabi-Yang variety or log abelian variety. And, uh, uh, well, yes, there will be after some finite extensions, a dense set of integral points, but uh, again, it's like counting points in abelian varieties. We don't have points there to uh, play with. So for additive groups, we proved that the anti-canonical class, uh, so if you look at some GA uh, compactification, um, then uh, the boundary, uh, 
So the anti-canonical class is the sum of the boundary components with coefficients kappa i bigger or equal than 2. So we are allowed to remove any combinations of the boundary components and our log anti-canonical class will still be in the interior of the effective cone. So that's good. So that's our supply of so x and boundary. And now what do we do? We have a Poisson formula. We used it uh, sum over all points. Well, the height again is a pairing between the Adels and the complex of fat Picard group. And I've skipped sort of uh, the coordinates, x and the s, the height. And now this is a delta function. And the delta function does the following. Well, if we have an integral point, then one. If it's not integral with respect to this boundary at these places outside s, then zero. So, and uh, the definition of integrality was completely local. So this is the product of these local functions. And when we write down the Poisson formula, sum over all characters of these kind of things, then this integral breaks into a product of local integrals. And uh, I showed you how to compute these local integrals geometrically. That was the business with periodic integration and with these strata. And now the picture is as follows. As you begin to compute these local integrals, um, mm, so the strata which you removed from the boundary, so that just translates to the fact that, well, uh, so remember, it's our integral over xfv, so integral, uh, was the same thing as the sum, or well, of integrals labeled by uh, some strata x of, um, mm, well, a priori x over a finite field fq, uh, but uh, maybe strata, sort of, uh, uh, well, j, j subset in the set of indices, uh, well, j subset in i, um, and um, uh, strata xj, mm, so union over all j. And for each of those, uh, to be integral with respect to the corresponding divisor just means you don't fall into the corresponding stratum. So and otherwise, the integration is completely analogous to what we had before. So there's a closed formula. And when you compute this, so you get a sum over all boundary strata so that the divisors which uh, you put in here don't appear in you know, your strata. Now, if you happen to choose the whole boundary, then uh, the contribution from the places outside uh, S is just going to be one. Because then you're in really integrating only over the compact subgroup uh, OV to the, to the corresponding dimension D. Okay, so that means to be integral with respect to the complete boundary. That's really an integral point on the additive group, like Z to the D. So that's what we are seeing at the uh, places outside S. But if you choose a subset of the boundary, then you still have some interesting color products there at the places outside S. Um, so this is a picture. Now, as before, you sort of instinctively assume that the trivial representation gives you the pole of highest order. And then you have to show that all the other representations, you can dominate them. And in fact, in this case, for integral points, the analytic part of the proof is much more involved than for rational points. But anyway, when you look at the trivial representation, so you get a product over integrals for places outside S, and this is a standard sort of integral from before, except that a few strata are missing from this sum. And then you have an integral over the places in S of your height function, but there are no constraints for places in S. And those integrals we've computed, we just see them. And uh, well, similarly to those, because they're just your full integrals. And then what you have to do, right, you have to analyze this integral, so this adelic integral. So you have to find out, well, what exactly is the leading pole coming from this Euler product, and what are the poles coming from here? And here you see that the poles of highest order come exactly from, uh, well, you get a simple pole along each of these divisors, so to speak. So, and then when they intersect, you get a double pole. You get like 1 over S1 times S2. And your triple intersection, you get 1 over S1, S2, S3 and so on. And when you restrict, then that gives you a pole of highest order, and that's how we arrive at uh, sort of the order of the pole. And to identify the um, Tamagawa numbers for all of this, you just, you know, re you really analyze what's happening locally. And this is, this is how it's done in the additive case, and there is, um, so to speak, a big program, so we have all the varieties at hand. 
And we uh, just need to show that the analytic techniques we have used for rational points can be pushed to uh, deal with integral points. So that will be a round picture. And of course, our motivation for doing that is that uh, there is, in fact, a rather large literature on how to count integral points on all kinds of homogeneous varieties. So you take your favorite group, GLN, so Z, and you pick some representation, and then you count Z uh, vectors in that representation and the translates. So there are results by uh, Duke, Rudnick, Sarnak, uh, Eskin, McMullen. There is a whole list of papers where integral points have been studied. But integral points, you see, on the complement to the whole boundary. So really, integral points on the group. So our approach is more flexible. It's geometric. We allow some pieces of the boundary. And in fact, uh, so the hope is that once uh, this is sort of really solid and you know, checked in all these cases for group compactifications, you could be able, you would be able to push some of that to these universal torsors, in particular to torsors which are homogeneous. So we have this example, Grassmannian to five divided by a torus, Grassmannian to six divided by a torus. You pick any flag variety, G mod P divided by a torus, you get interesting varieties whose torsor will be this Grassmannian. So is there a way to link the counting of rational points downstairs, counting of integral points on the torus, and harmonic analysis, the way we are implementing it here in these special situations. So that's degree five till pet's the surface, which I explained, but over number fields instead of Q. So it's open. Singular cubic surfaces, some of those you've seen over Q or field extensions. Segregate cubic threefold. So here are the ex equations for that over the number field. So far, only rational points. Now, so this is a compactification of an affine space. So this variety. Uh, so if you like, you can again parameterize all the points in some of the risky open subset by an explicit A5. So A5 is an explicit map into this uh, product uh, into P3 times P3. And um, there is a height. And uh, uh, you want to count points on complements, say, to xj equals 0, yj equals 0. And it's open. So I know that uh, specialists in quadratic forms have worked on that. So if you like, this is a family of quadrics parameterized by the axis, or you have a family of projective spaces parameterized by the y's. So either way, uh, it's unclear. So this is a height. You want to count lattice points with respect to this uh, uh, height inequality. So quotients of like varieties by tori I find very intriguing. For example, for very special groups, like a group G of type G2 split. Or, and this is another vexing thing, so uh, there is a theorem, uh, all these conjectures are true for bi-equivariant compactifications of non-commutative groups, the Heisenberg group, unipotent groups. Bi-equivariant means that it's actually compactifications of G cross G over G. So you have a G action on the left and on the right. But if you take the Heisenberg group, a very simple group, you know, X, Z, Y, and look at uh, a one-sided sort of equivariant compactification. That is, just pick a representation of the Heisenberg group and some PGLN and then plus one and then look at what happens. We don't know how to deal with this analytically. So if you write down the spectral expansion, then uh, the difference is that in the bi-equivariant case, you sort of have, you deal with spherical functions and you can analyze that. In this, in the one-sided case, your spectral side will also have a sum, so to speak, over all K types. And uh, to control this sum, sort of uniformly, analytically, it seems to be quite difficult and unpleasant. So, and uh, this you see also for groups like PGL2. If you look at one-sided equivariant compactifications of PGL2, we don't know how to proceed. So these varieties actually do have moduli. And this is a question I think asked in the second lecture. So you have this uh, representation of PGL2, and then you pick a point, and then you take an orbit through this point. Now, the point, you can vary in the projective space. And the varieties you obtain are sort of not the same. They vary. You have moduli. All right. And finally, you can look at other cases, extensions of your groups you understand by tori and, you know, these kind of groups. And uh, so, again, uh, for uh, sort of me, when I was so developing some of this analytically, it's sort of striking. So you learn about harmonic analysis on the delic points of these groups. 
And then you sort of write down the obvious thing, but then in the background you have this geometry which uh, uh, you know, just uh, pops out of uh, these local and global com computations. And uh, uh, you look at all these different groups, uh, commutative, non-commutative, semi-simple, and you know, unipotent. And in all cases, it's the same geometric picture. So I'm quite confident that uh, in the equivariant case, I mean, this is what's happening. And for rational points and for integral points, and uh, uh, so pushing uh, the boundaries further uh, would involve you know, more geometry and understanding sort of the higher dimensional geometry in much more detail. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.